Hi everyone and welcome to the Better Everyday YouTube channel. My name is Randy. Today we are going to be watching the next uh, lecture in the biblical lecture series or biblical series of lectures from Dr. Jordan Peterson. This one is titled God and the Hierarchy of Authority. I've really enjoyed these lectures, the first two. And I think the first one I separated into three reactions and then the second one I did four or perhaps it was the other way around. And it is, uh, for me, hard to kind of like predetermine how long I'm going to be able to watch it because I have interruptions all the time. So my plan is today to watch some, see how far it gets instead of saying from the get-go, this will be four reactions, this will be six reactions. I'm not sure. I'm hoping I can watch 20 or 30 minutes of it today, but I doubt I'll be able to watch more than that. But either way, I'm excited. And I will say too, that with the biblical series, I've been posting two reactions per week, so it's not so spaced out, if that makes sense, because it all does come from this lecture is one lecture, so instead of doing it once a week over the course of a month, which seems like a very long time, watching it twice per week uh, over the course of two weeks or something, I feel like is a little better. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Anyway, without further ado, here we go. I'm really looking forward to this lecture, not Genesis quite, I was one looking conclusion. Forward to the other ones, but the, the stories that I want to cover tonight, I, one of the things that just absolutely staggers me about them, especially the story of Cain and Abel, which I hope to get to, is like it's so short, it's unbelievable. It's like 10, 11 lines. There's nothing to it at all. And I've found that it's essentially inexhaustible in its capacity to reveal meaning. And I don't exactly know what to make of that. I mean, I do, I think, you know, because I said I was going to take as rational an approach to this issue as I possibly could. I think it has something to do with this intense process of condensation across very long periods of time. That's the simplest explanation. But I'll tell you, the information in there is so densely packed that it really is, it's really, it's not that easy to come up with an explanation for that. Not one that, that I find fully compelling. I mean, I do think that the really old stories, and, and we've been covering the, the really archaic stories in the Bible so far, I think that one of the things that you can be virtually certain about is that everything about them that was memorable was remembered, right? And so in some sense, and this is kind of like the idea of Richard Dawkins' ideas of memes, which is often why I thought that Richard Dawkins, if he was a little bit more uh, mystically inclined, he would have become Carl Jung, because their theories are unbelievably similar. The similar of meme and the similar of arch and the idea of archetype of the collective unconscious are very, very similar ideas, except mm. the Jungian idea is far more profound in, in my estimation. Well, it, it just is. It's, it's, he thought it through so much better, you know, um, because Dawkins tended to think of meme as, as sort of like a mind worm, you know, something that would infest a mind and maybe multiple minds, but he never really took, I don't think he really ever took the idea with the seriousness it deserved, and I did uh, hear him actually make a joke with Sam Harris the last time they talked about the fact that, that Talk about Richard uh, Dawkins. there was some possibility that the the, the pr production of memes, say religious memes, could alter evolutionary history, and they both avoided that topic instantly. They had a big laugh about it, and then decided they weren't going to go down that road. And so, that wasn't very. That was quite interesting to me. But huh. um, these, these, the, the 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 density of these stories, I do really think, still is a is a mystery. It it certainly has something to do with their absolute. Their, in, their impossibility to be forgotten. You know, and that's actually something that be t could be tested empirically. I don't know if anybody has ever done that, because you could tell naive people two stories even equal length, right? One that had an archetypal theme and the other that didn't, uh -huh. and then wait three months and see which ones people remembered better. Mm. It would be, be a relatively straightforward thing to test. I yeah. haven't tested it, but maybe I will at some point. But anyways, and that'd be that's interesting. all to say that I'm very um, excited about this lecture because... I get an opportunity to go over the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Cain and Abel, and I hope we manage both of those today, and maybe we'll get to the story of Noah and the Tower of Babel as well, but I wouldn't count on it. Not at the rate we've been, <laughs> <laughs> not at the rate we've been progressing, but that's okay. That's, that's no problem. It starts it's, out so just no sense rushing full this. speed. All right, so we're going to go, before we go that, before we do that, I want to con con finish my discussion of the idea of the psychological significance of the idea of God, and I've been thinking about this a lot more you know, because, of course, this lecture series gives me the opportunity and the necessity to continue to think. And, you know, it, it, it certainly is the case. So the, the hypothesis that I've been developing with the Trinitarian idea is something like that the Trinitarian idea is the earliest emergence in image 
of the idea that there has to be an underlying cognitive structure that gives rise to consciousness as Hold well on. as consciousness itself. And so you lost me. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back a little bit here. The hypothesis that I've been developing within the Trinitarian idea is something like developing with the Trinitarian idea is something like that the Trinitarian idea is the earliest emergence in image of the idea that there has to be an underlying cognitive structure that gives rise to consciousness as well as consciousness itself. And so what I was suggesting was that the idea of God the Father is something akin to the idea of the a priori structure that, that gives rise to consciousness, you know, that's, that's an inbuilt part of us, so that's our structure. You could think about that as something that's been produced over a vast evolutionary time span, and I don't think that's completely out of keeping with the, with the, uh, with the ideas that are laid forth in Genesis 1, at least if you think about them from a metaphorical perspective. And it's hard to read them literally because I don't know what, you know, well, there's an emphasis on day and night, but the, the idea of day and night as, as 24-hour diurnal, you know, uh, d day time and night time, uh, interchanges that are based on the clock on the earthly clock seems to be a bit absurd when you first start to think about the construction of the cosmos so it just doesn't seem to me that a li literal interpretation is appropriate and i mean it's another thing that you might not know but you know many of the early church fathers one of them origin in, in particular stated very clearly this was in 300 a.d that the, these ancient stories were to be taken as 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 wise metaphors and not to be taken literally like the idea that the people who established christianity for example were all the sorts of people who were biblical literalists. It's just absolutely historically wrong. I mean, some of them were, and some of them still are. That's not the point. Many of them weren't, and it's not like people who lived 2,000 years ago were stupid by any stretch of the imagination. And so they were perfectly capable of understanding what, cons you know, what constituted something approximating a metaphor, and also knew that fiction, in some sense, considered as an abstraction, could tell you truths that, that nonfiction wasn't able, wasn't able to get at unless you think that fiction is only for entertainment, and I think that's a very, that's a, that's a big mistake to, to think that. So, all right, so here we go. So, yes, yeah, so with regards to the idea of, of God the Father, so the idea is that in order to make sense out of the world, you have to have an a priori cognitive structure, and that was something that Immanuel Kant, as I, as I said last time, um, uh, put forward as an argument against the idea that all of the information that we uh, acquired during our lifetime as a consequence of incoming sense data. And the reason that Kant objected to that, and he was absolutely right about this, is that you can't make sense of sense data without an a priori structure. You can't extract from sense data the structure that enables you to make sense of sense data. Yeah. It's not possible. And that's really been demonstrated, I would say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, since the 1960s. And the best demonstration of that was actually the initial failure of artificial intelligence. Because when the AI people started promising that we would have fully functional and autonomous robots and, and artificial intelligence back in the 1960s, um, what they didn't understand and what stalled them terribly until about the early 1990s was that it was almost that the problem of perception was a much deeper problem than anybody ever recognized. Because, like, when you look out the world, you just see, well, look, there's objects out there. And by the way, yeah. you don't see objects, you see tools, J just so you know. And the neurobiology of that's quite clear. You don't see objects and infer utility. You see useful things and infer object. So it's actually the reverse of what people generally think. Hmm. But the point is, is that regardless of whether you see objects or useful things, when you look at the world, you just see it. And you think, well, seeing is easy because there the things are. And all you have to do is like, you know, turn your head and they appear. And that's yeah. just so wrong that it's, that it's almost impossible to overstate. Like the, the problem of perception is staggeringly difficult. And one of the primary reasons that we still don't really have autonomous robots, although we're a lot closer to it than we were in the 1960s, is because mm -hmm. it turned out that you actually have to have in a body, you have to have a body before you can think. And even more importantly, you have to have a body before you can see, because the act of seeing is actually the act of mapping the patterns of the world onto the patterns of the body. It's not things are out there, you see them, then you think about them, then you evaluate them, then you decide to act on them, and then you act. I mean, that, that you could call that a folk idea of, of psychological processing or perception. It's not, that is not how it works. Like your eyes, for example, map, one of the things they do is map right onto your spinal cord, for example. They map right onto your emotional system. So it's actually possible, for example, for people to be blind and still be able to detect facial expressions, which is to say you can, with someone who's cortically blind, so they've had their visual cortex destroyed often by a stroke, they'll tell you that they can't see anything. 
but they can guess which hand you put up if you ask them to, and if you flash them pictures of angry or fearful faces, they show skin conductance responses to the more emotion-laden faces, and it's because, imagine that the world is made out of patterns, which it is, and then imagine that those patterns are transmitted to you electromagnetically, that through light, and then imagine that the pattern is duplicated on the retina, and then that pattern is propagated along the optic nerve, and then the pattern is distributed throughout your brain, and some yeah. of that pattern makes up what you call conscious vision, but other parts of it just activate your body. And so, for example, when I look at this, when I look at this, uh, this uh, whatever, it, whatever it is, <laughs> bottle, that's the word. <laughs> You know, when I look at it, especially with intent in mind, as soon as I look at it, the pattern of the, of the bottle activates the gripping mechanism of my hand, and part of the action of per or the, the act of perception is to adjust my bodily posture, including my hand grip, to be of the optimal size to pick that up. And yeah. it, it's not that I see the bottle and then think about to how to move my hand. That's too slow. It's that. I use my motor, motor cortex to perceive the bottle, and that's actually somewhat independent of actually seeing the bottle as a conscious experience. So, anyway, uh, the, the, re the reason that I'm telling you that all of that. Also, and, and, and I just want to say really quickly, I'm fidgety uh, because if you haven't watched my stuff before, when I watch Jordan Peterson for whatever reason, if I am the least bit tired, watching him amplifies it not because it's boring, but because. It's all here, and I'm not moving to music, and I'm also sitting still, which I don't do really except for when I record things. Um, so I'm moving to kind of keep myself alert and uh, fully attentive, so I'm sorry if it's distracting. Anyways, uh, the, the, re the reason that I'm telling you that all of that, and, and, and there's much more about that that can be told, Rodney Brooks, he's someone to know about. He's a robotics engineer who worked in the 1990s, and he invented the Roomba, um, among many other things. So he's a real That's genius. That's a little robot guy. vacuum. And uh, he, Brooks was one of the first people to really point out that uh, to, have, to be able to have a, 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 a machine that perceived well enough to work in the world, that you had to give it a body. And that yeah. the perception would actually be built from the body up rather than the, from the abstract cognitive perceptions down. And so, well, and that, that turned out to be the case. And B Brooks built all sorts of weird little machines in the 1990s that didn't even really have any central brain, but they could do things like run away from light. And so they could perceive light, but their perception was the act of running away from light. Hmm. And so perception, perception is very, very, very tightly tied to action in ways that people don't normally perceive. Anyways, that's all to say that you cannot perceive the world without being embodied. And, you know, you're embodied in a manner that's taken you roughly three and a half billion years to pull off, right? There's been a lot of death as a prerequisite to the embodied form that you take. And so it's taken all that trial and error to produce something like you that can interact with the complexity of the world well enough to last the relatively paltry 80 or so years that you can last. Okay. And so I think about that as, and this may be wrong, but I think it's a useful, at least it's a useful uh, hypothesis. I think the idea of God the Father is something like the birth of the idea that there has to be an internal structure that out of which consciousness itself arises that gives form to things. And well, and, and if that's the case, and perhaps it's not, but if it's the case, it's certainly reflection, it's a reflection of the kind of factual truth that I've been describing now. And then uh, like I also mentioned that I kind of see the, the idea of both the Holy Spirit and also of Christ, and most specifically of Christ in, in the form of the word as the active consciousness that that structure produces and uses, not only to, to formulate the world, because we formulate the world, at least the world that we experience, we formulate, but also to change and modify that world, because there's absolutely no doubt that we do that, partly with our bodies, which are optimally evolved to do that, which is why we have hands, unlike dolphins that have, you know, very large brains like us, but can't really change the world. <laughs> We're really adapted and evolved to change the world, and the world and our speech is really a, an extension of our ability to use our hands. So the speech systems that we use are, you know, very well developed motor, uh, very well developed motor skill. Yeah. And generally speaking, your your dominant linguistic hemisphere is the same as your dominant hand. 
and people talk with their hands, like me, as you mm -hmm. may have noticed, and we use sign language, okay. and there's a tight relationship between the use of the hand and the use of language, mm -hmm. and that's partly because uh, language is a productive force, and the hand is the part, of the, part of what changes the world. And so all those things are tied together in a very, very complex way with this a priori structure and also with the embodied structure. And I also think that's part of the reason why classical Christianity puts such an emphasis not only on the divinity of the spirit, but also on the divinity of the body, which is a harder thing to grapple with. You know, it's, it's easier for people to think, if you think in religious terms at all, that you have some sort of transcendent spirit that's somehow detached from the body that might have some life after death, something like that. But the Christian, Christianity in particular, really insists on the divinity of the body. So the idea is that there's an underlying structure that's got this quasi-patriarchal nature, partly because it's for complex reasons, but partly because it's a reflection of the social structure as well as other things. And then that uses consciousness in the form particularly of language, but most particularly in the form of truthful language in order to produce the world in a manner that's good. And I think that's a walloping, powerful, powerful idea, especially the relationship between the idea that it's truthful speech that gives rise to the good, because that's a really fundamental moral claim. And I think that's a tough one to beat, man, because yeah. one of the things I've really noticed is, and, and this and it isn't just really me. Really quickly, I just want to, I'll back it up a little bit. I feel like, I, I'm sure that as he's speaking, he is on a, a, a specific, line of thought and there perhaps as a specific reason to going this way and of course he's probably got a couple of little side topics within that overarching path of what he, the journey he's taking us on through the lecture but sometimes it's hard to keep up with him and I'm not an idiot I'm a doctoral student I do research um, so I can usually keep up Pretty well, better than my counterparts, my friends. But um, he just, I feel like he's all over it. I'm, if he's doing this with the Slim Jim, this is his line of thought. And if I'm keeping up with him and then he starts taking these side routes, then I end up getting lost somewhere. And in order to get back to his line of thinking, I've missed at least one or two things or not missed, but I haven't been able to wrap my mind completely around every single concept he's discovered because because of the, the subject matter, I'm just not as well versed in what he's talking about. So it's taking me a tiny bit more time to kind of grip it all. It's super fascinating though. Um, but I wanted to pause. There was another reason that I had paused. And I don't remember the main reason, but part of it also was to allow that last thing that he said to kind of solidify in my mind. Anyway. Because that's a really fundamental moral claim. And I think that's a tough one to beat, man, because one of the things I've really noticed is, and, and this and it isn't just me, that's for sure, is that, you know, there's a lot of tragedy in life. There's no doubt about that. And lots of people that I see, for example, in my clinical practice are laid low by the tragedy of life. But I also see very, very frequently that people get tangled up in deceit, in webs of deceit that are often multiple generations long. And that just takes them out, you know. And so, the, so deceit can produce extraordinary levels of suffering that, that last yeah. for very, very long periods of time. And that's really a clinical truism, you know, because Freud, of course, identified one of the problems that contributed to the suffering we might associate with mental illness with repression, which is kind of like a lie of omission. That's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. And Jung stated straight out that there was no difference between the psychotherapeutic, the curative psychotherapeutic effort and supreme moral effort, including truth. That, those were the same thing as far as he was concerned. And Carl Rogers, another great clinician who was at one point a Christian missionary before he became um, more, more, more strictly scientific. That's interesting. He believed that it was in truthful dialogue that, that that uh, clinical transformation took place, and mm. you know it, it, it. And of course, one of the sense. prerequisites for genuine transformation in the clinical setting is that the therapist tells the truth and the Honestly. client tells the truth. Because yeah. otherwise, how in the world do you know what's going on? How can you solve a problem when you don't even know what the problem is? Yeah, you, and you don't know what the problem is unless the person tells you the truth. 
that's something really to think about in light of your own relationships because you know if you don't tell the people around you the truth then they don't know who you are and maybe that's a good thing you know because well seriously people have reasons to lie right I mean that aren't trivial but it's really worth knowing that you can't even get your hands on the problem unless you formulate it truthfully and if you can't yeah. get your hands on the problem the probability that you're going to solve it is just, just so low and so then I totally understand what he's saying there and that's not just in psychology that's anything let's say I'm running a business if I can't identify the an issue honestly then I cannot fix it I could try to band-aid it by doing other things but you have to be honest about what the problem is or you cannot effectively address said problem so I totally get that and in psychology too I've been thinking about as well the, this, this, and, and this idea has become more credible to me the, the longer I've developed it, the, the, the longer I've thought about it. You know, the idea that there's, I'll, I'll, I'll go back, it's partly the idea that, go pop. <laughs> well, let me, let me figure out how to start this properly. Friend of mine, business partner, and a, a guy that I've written scientific papers with, very smart guy, took me to task, and I think I told you this a little bit about, using the term dominance hierarchy, which might be fine for like chimpanzees and for lobsters and, and, and for creatures like that, but not, not, for, not, not for chimpanzees even so much. And, and he said something very interesting. He thought that the idea of dominance hierarchy was actually a projection of a early 20th century quasi-Marxist hypothesis onto the animal kingdom that was being observed. And the notion that the hierarchical structure that you see that characterizes, say, mating hierarchies in, in chimps, for example, I don't know the idea that hierarchies. that was predicated on power was actually a projection of a kind of political ideology. And I thought really? that really bugged me for a long time when he said that. That's because like because I'd really been used to using the term dominance hierarchy, and I thought he, he told me all that, I thought, ugh, that's so annoying. It's so annoying because it might be right, and, and it took me months to think about it. And then I and then I was also reading Franz de Waal at the same time. Time, and he's a primatologist, and also Jack Panksepp, who's, who's a brilliant, brilliant affective neuroscientist who unfortunately just died. He wrote a great book called Affective Neuroscience, and for rats to play, they have to play fair or they won't play with each other. And that's, that's a staggering discovery, right? Because anything that helps um, instantiate the, uh, the emergence of ethical behavior in animals and that associates it with an evolutionary process, which is essentially what, what, what Panksepp was doing, gives credence to the notion that the ethics that guide us are not mere sociological epiphenomenal constructs. They're deep, deeply rooted. If rats, and they're rats for God's sake, you can't trust them, and they still play fair, you know. And DeWall noticed that the chimp troops that he studied like the, it, wasn't, it wasn't the barbar barbaric chimp that ruled with an iron fist that was the successful ruler because he kept getting torn to shreds by, his, by the compatriots that he ignored and stomped on. As soon as he showed some weakness, they'd just tear him into pieces. The chimp leaders that were stable, you know, that had a stable kingdom, let's say, were very reciprocal in terms of their interactions with their friends. And chimps have friends, and they, ask, they actually last for a very long time, chimp friendships. And they were also very... Um, reciprocal in their inter interactions with the females and with the infants. And I, I mm. thought, that's a, that's a, Franz de Waal is a very smart guy. And I thought that was also foundational science because it's really something to note that the attributes that give rise to dominance in a male dominance hierarchy, sorry to use that word, let's call it authority, that might be better, or even shudder competence, which I think is a better way of thinking about it, is that that's not predicated purely on anything that's, that's, that's as simple as brute power. And I think too, you know, I think as well that the idea, and this is a deeply devious and dangerous political idea in my estimation, the idea that male dominance hierarchies, sorry, male hierarchies are fundamentally predicated on power in a, in a law-abiding law society, I think is, I think all you have to do is think about that for like a month, say, <laughs> which isn't that long, to understand how absurd that is. Because most people who are in positions of authority, let's say, are just as hemmed in by ethical responsibility, or even more so, than people at the other levels of the, of the hierarchy. And we know this yeah. even in the managerial literature, because we know, generally speaking, that managers are more stressed by their subordinates than the subordinates are stressed by their managers. And that's not surprising. You, know, you want to be responsible for like 200 people? 
You really want that? That's hard work, man. It's not wrong there, working in management. I went into pause a moment ago when he was talking about the chimps and he had said that a researcher, and I may have misunderstood what he was saying, but that perhaps the original research was published um, with the conclusion that it was likely that the chimp hierarchy was associated with power and that the people at the top were um, dominating uh, or had more power. And those aren't the right words, but hopefully you know what I mean. But then someone said perhaps that conclusion was made based on a projection by the researcher and I don't know, age, wisdom, and education has made me aware of that, recognizing that in, in research, the people who ultimately bring the results together and write up their conclusion, um, summary, each individual is going to have some type of bias, we'll just say whether it's something they want to see or something that they already believed or something that they felt and that's what the purpose of the conclusion the summary are is for the researcher based on what information exists and what was found in the study perhaps what that study might represent but it's important to realize that that's not um, what is it correlation is not causation I think is uh, the phrase doesn't mean that is in fact the cause of that so it makes me wonder that um, the chimp hierarchy thing before it was clarified that that might not actually be the reason it may not be directly caused by the power associated with an individual chimp how long was that research used with that potential conclusion but even if it were um, because an argument could be made either way um, I don't know, I just thought it was interesting that he mentioned that and it made me curious about the study and it made me think about my own experience um, reviewing research. Anyway, sorry. You want to be responsible for like 200 people? You really want that? That's hard work, man. And I mean, I know it's yeah, a pain to have a boss okay. because you have to care about what the boss thinks. And maybe the person is arbitrary, in which case they're not going to be particularly successful. But it's no joke to be responsible for 200 people. And you have yeah. to behave very carefully when you're in a position of responsibility and authority like that because you will get called out if you make mistakes yeah. constantly. So it's not like you're, it's not like because you have a position that's higher up in the hierarchy that you're less constrained by ethical necessity. Now, if you're a psychopath, well, that's a whole different story, but psychopaths have to move pretty rapidly from hierarchy to hierarchy, right? Because they get found out quite quickly. And as mm. soon as their reputation is shattered, then they can't get away with their shenanigans anymore. So, okay, so all of this is to say that there is something very interesting about the pattern of behavior. So imagine that Imagine that sexual selection is working something like this, and, and, and we know that sexual selection is a very, 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 very powerful biological force, even though biologists ignored it for almost 100 years after Charles Darwin originally wrote about it, thinking mostly about natural selection. They didn't like the idea of sexual selection because it tended to introduce the notion of mind into the process of evolution because it, it deals with choice. Yeah. You know? but, so imagine, on the one hand, that you have a male hierarchy, we know that the men at the top of the hierarchy are much more likely to be reproductively successful than the men at the bottom. That's particularly true of men. So you have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. I'm not going to do the math, but, and I know it doesn't sound plausible, but it, you could look it up and figure it out. And it's a it's perfectly reasonable fact that it actually happens to be true. So there's twice as, you have twice as many female ancestors because females are twice as likely, on average, to leave offspring as men. Now what happens is, any man, man who does reproduce tends to reproduce more than once, but a bunch of them reproduce zero. Whereas, so it would be, the average man who reproduces has two children, and the average man who doesn't reproduce has zero, obviously, and the average woman who reproduces has one child. So, that means that there's twice as many females in your line as there is males. So, that, that's a big deal. And, and so, imagine that it works something like this. So, the men elect the, the, the competent men who are, are admired and who are, uh, and who are uh, 
I can't say dominant, who are, who are given positions of authority and respect. Let's put it that way. And it's like an election. Now, it could be an actual democratic election, but it's at least an election of consensus, or it's at least an election of, well, we're not going to kill him for now, which is also a form of election, right? It's a form of tolerance, you know? So, so and then what happens is the women, for their part, peel from the top of the male hierarchy. And so you've got two factors that are driving human sexual selection across vast stretches of evolutionary time. One is the election of men by men to positions where they're much more likely to reproduce. And mm. the second is the tendency of women to peel off the top of male dominance hierarchies, which is extraordinarily well established cross-culturally. Yeah. Even if you flatten out the socioeconomic uh, disparity, say, between men and women, like they've done in Scandinavia, you don't... You don't uh, uh, reduce the tendency of women to peel off the top of the male hierarchy by much. And why, why would you? I mean, women are smart. Why in the world wouldn't they go for, for, why wouldn't they strive to make relationships with men who are relatively successful? And yeah. why wouldn't they let the men themselves define why that, how that constitutes success? It makes sense. Like, if you want to figure out who the best man is, why not let the men compete and the, the, man, the man who wins, whatever the competition is, is the best man by definition. How else fun. would you define it? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so why am I telling you all that? Well, the reason is, is because saying. it seems to me that there's, this comp there's been this complex interplay across human evolution between the election of the male dominance hierarchy and sexual success. And that's a big deal if it's true. Yeah. It could be, because what would happen, you see, is that as men evolved, they would evolve to be better and better at climbing up the male hierarchy. Mm. Because the ones who weren't good at that wouldn't reproduce. So obviously that's going to happen. But then it wouldn't just be a hierarchy, because there's a whole bunch of different hierarchies. And so mm. then you might say, well, are there commonalities across hierarchies? That's a reasonable thing to propose. It, it, I mean, they're not completely opposed to one another, at least. If yeah. you're more success, relatively more successful in one hierarchy, then you're more probable, it's more probable that you'll be successful in another. And that's yeah. actually a really good definition of general intelligence or IQ. And that's actually one of the things that women select men for. Now, men also select women for that, but the selection pressure is even higher from women to men. And general IQ is one of the things that propels you up across dominance hierarchies because it's a general problem-solving mechanism. And the other thing that seems to do that to some degree is conscientiousness. And there's also some evidence that women prefer conscientious men. So, and, and of course, why wouldn't they? Because you can trust them, and, yeah. and, 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 and they work, and so those are both good things. So then you think, okay, so men have adapted to start to climb the male dominance hierarchy, but it's the set of all possible hierarchies that they're adapted to climb. Okay. And so then you think there's, there's a set of attributes that can be acted out, that, and that can be embodied, that will increase the probability that you're going to rise to the top of any given hierarchy. And then you could say, well, that as you adapt to that fact, then you start to develop an understanding of what that pattern constitutes. Yeah. And so that starts to become the abstract representation of something like multidimensional competence. And that's like the abstraction of virtue itself. Well, and none of that has, then none of that's arbitrary, man. That's as bloody well grounded in biology as anything could be. And I think that's a really hard argument to refute. And like one of the things I should tell you about how I think is that when I think something, I spend a long time trying to figure out if it's wrong, you know, because I like awesome. to hack at it from every possible direction yeah. to see if it's a weak idea, because if it's a weak idea, then I'd rather just dispense with it and find something better. Yeah. And I've Good had a real hard time trying to figure out what's wrong with that idea. I, it, it's, it seems to me that it's pretty damn solid. And then the idea... Really quickly, I want to mention, um, sorry for smoking on the film. Um, uh, I see exact. I see what he's saying about uh, how a person is able to move to the top of a hierarchy and then learns to be able to move among hierarchies and have a skill set, you know, a broad-based competence, so to speak, that enables them to be up in the upper part of a hierarchy or multiple hierarchies um, coming at it from like a business angle. That is something people study all the time from a pr business perspective, getting MBAs and similar things, looking for uh, a set of tools or methods or theories that are going to uh, provide the best mode or the best 
skill set to be successful. So I understand exactly what he's saying. He's just coming at it from uh, a cultural, soci sociological, mm, a social structure kind of approach, but just based on the area I teach in and what I'm studying, I'm seeing it from a business perspective as applied to um, just business operations and strategies, but I see what he's saying. Sorry. It, it, it's, it seems to me that it's pretty damn solid. And then the idea that, you know, if you watch what people do in movies and so on and when they're reading fiction, it's obvious that they're very good at identifying both the hero and the anti-hero. We could say the anti-hero, generally speaking, the bad guy, is someone who strives for, do for, for authority and, and position but fails, G generally speaking, not always, but fails. So he's a good, bad example. Yeah. A kid, you take a kid to a, a good guy, bad guy movie, the kid figures out pretty fast that he's not supposed to be the bad guy <laughs> and, and figures out very quickly to zero in on the good guy. And that means that there's, there's an affinity between the pattern of good guy that's being played out in the fiction and the perceptual capacity of the child. You know, and one of the things I told my son when he was a kid, when I used to take him to movies that were sometimes we had more frightening than they should have been, but mm -hmm. um, one of the things I always told him was, I never said don't be afraid, because I, I think that's bad advice for kids. What I said was, keep your eye on the hero, right? Keep your eye on the hero. And he, and, like, he was gripped by the movie and often quite afraid of them, you know, because movies can be very frightening, so he'd just like zero in on that guy and hoping, and you know what it's like in a movie, you hope that the good guy wins, generally speaking. And, I mean, why do you do that? Where does that, where does that come from? You see how deeply rooted that is inside you. You'll bloody well go line up and pay to watch that happen. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to understand, and it's, it's so self-evident to people that we don't even notice that it's a tremendous mystery. Yeah. And so, is it so unreasonable to think that we would have actually, over the millennia, come to some sort of collective conclusion about what the best of the best guys are, best of the good guys are, and what the worst of the bad guys are? And to me, archetypally speaking, thinking of that as the, the hostile brothers, so that's Christ and Satan, or Cain and Abel, for example, very common mythological motif, the hostile brothers, it's like, those are, those, those are archetypes. It's like the, the Satan, for example, is by definition the worst that a person can be. Yeah. And Christ, by definition, this is independent of anything but conceptualization, is by definition the best that a, that a man can be. Yeah. Now, as I said, I'm speaking psychologically and conceptually, but I, I, given our capacity for imagination and our ability to engage in fiction, and our love for fiction, and our capacity to dramatize, and our love for the story, stories of heroism and catastrophe and, and good and evil, I can't see how it could be any other way. Yeah. Like, so, well, so, so that's part of the idea that's driving the notion of the evolution of the idea of God, and, and even more specifically, driving the evolution of the idea, at least in part, of the Trinity. So, God is an abstracted okay, ideal I'm gonna go ahead formulated and pause here. in large... I feel bad pausing it, but... When he puts up a slide, I know we're moving on to something else, so I feel like that's a good pause. But it's only 30 minutes in, so what is that? Six? Next time I'm going to try to watch more. I knew I wouldn't have a terrible or a, an extensive amount of time to record today. We have company coming over to my house, and so I need to clean. Um, but you, you don't care about that. I enjoyed that. I kept up with, after I paused and said I wasn't keeping up with absolutely everything he was saying, after that pause, I was able to keep up with a lot more. I should have had coffee with me though. Coffee just gives my brain that extra kick. Um, it's not that I'm not able to understand what he's saying. It's just tired plus um, not being as versed in psychology as him, obviously. And it's been a long time since I studied psychology. Like I said, I'll look at um, papers, um, scholarly research sometimes that is in the field of psychology but not enough to be anywhere close to nowhere close to um his level of understanding of the field but this has been really interesting so far um my main worry with separating it up is i won't remember the key things from this but i should because like i said i am going to watch it twice per week so there won't be as much time between recordings should be able to
uh, not miss anything between the pieces. Anyway, I enjoyed it so far and I look forward to watching the rest. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.